Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to um, everyone um, to the third of the EU Public Affairs Insider Series brought to you by John Harper Publishing. Um, today our session is on how to engage the Council. Uh, my name is Nick DaCosta. I um, will be hosting today's session and hopefully make it as interesting as possible um, to all of you, um, although I'm going to put more of the pressure on Sabina and Roland and as I'm sure you are desperately looking forward to what they're saying. Um, before I hand over to uh, John Harper from John Harper Publishing, just want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be doing today. Um, please note that we are recording this session and it will be available on the John Harper Publishing website um, for your colleagues to have a look at. Um, so please make sure A, you're muted and your cameras are turned off. Um, we're going to have a short introduction from John Harper and then presentations from our two esteemed authors, Sabina and Roland. Um, we will have a very, very short moment for Q&A after Sabina's presentation, mainly if there's any technical questions, but we do want to keep the main Q&A session to the end to allow as much discussion as possible um, and interaction. Um, so Sabina will talk first, then Roland, and then we'll come on to the main Q&A. What we would love for you to do, if you have any questions for the Q&A, pop them into the chat function. If you could let us know who the question is directed to, that will help me out a little bit, knowing who to ask, um, and also the authors knowing who to who should um, be speaking. Um, and we want to try and get through as many questions as possible. Of course, um, with any um, with any of these events, we want to try and get as many of the questions answered as possible. So. Um, we'll get through as many of those. Um, before we kick off, and you're going to hear this repeated, but um, repetition is uh, very important in things like in events like this. Um, highly recommend you to pop online to John Harper Publishing website. And if you haven't done so yet, go out, buy the books. They are brilliant. They're available online and also across um, Brussels as well. Um, so please do make sure you pop out and get two of the most important books on engaging with EU institutions. With that in mind, and just admitting the last few people into uh, the meeting, I would like to hand over to um, John Harper from John Harper Publishing, who I'll ask to unmute. Well, thank you, Nick, um, and welcome everybody to the third of our Public Affairs Insider series um, on Zoom. Uh, just as with the two previous sessions, we've got one author uh, from each of the books on which this series is based. Um, firstly, Sabina Langer. Sabina contributed to what we call the, the Orange Book, this one. Uh, this is the book describing how the EU legislative machinery works. And Sabina's um, a senior lecturer in the European Institute of Public Administration, which you can probably guess from the uh, sign which will appear behind her, um, which, uh, of course, um, I'm sure many of you know is the highly prestigious training ground for many uh, European Union and national civil servants. Uh, in her training work, Sabina's specialities include the Council and the Commission's delegated powers, and she covered both those subjects in the Orange Book. Our second speaker uh, is Roland, Roland Moore. Roland contributed to this one. He contributed on the Council. Um, Roland has a background in the UK civil service, including periods spent in the Cabinet Office and in the UK permanent representation. He's now a senior consultant at Burson, Cohn and Wolf, which um, probably many people will think of as Burson Marstella, which it formerly was, um, which of course is one of the, the biggest of all players in the public affairs arena, really on a worldwide basis. Now, the council, um, it would be fair to say, has a reputation as perhaps the most opaque of the three big institutions. Uh, it tends to be seen as a discreetly powerful body, almost the sort of the eminence grise of the Brussels institutions. 
I think that Sabina is going to be telling us that despite this reputation, in essence, the workings of the council are actually straightforward, while Roland will confirm the view that it can be difficult to work with the council. Between them, they're going to explain how these seemingly contradictory ideas are at the same time both true. So this will be a very intriguing and fascinating session. So to start the ball rolling, um, I'll hand over without any more ado to Sabina. Thank you, John, for your support in this, and thank you, Nick. Now, years ago, when working on the first edition of what today are two books, we discussed with Alan Hardiker, uh, the original books editor and colleague at APA at the time, who also called us the chapter on EP, which, which institution is more complex, the council or the EP? After a lengthy discussion, we eventually agreed that to each of us, the one that we know better seems less complex. And that is no surprising conclusion. But the fact that the council is in its tasks, composition, structure, workflow and working methods easier to grasp leads us to think that, you know, we know it. While, as Roland will show later, it may actually also lead us to underestimate its complexity when engaging with it. Now, the second misperception those engaging with the European public affairs are prone to is the one of the fading power of the council. Speaking, speaking broadly, with every reform treaty and with none as much as with the Treaty of Lisbon, the Council increasingly had to share its powers with the EP. Now, to the extent that when the Treaty of Lisbon entered into force, the Council was actually labelled by many as the loser of the Treaty of Lisbon. Now, over a decade of multiple crises later, those voices faded away, but the power of the Council did not do so. Now, there are several reasons for it, and let me name just a few institutional ones. Uh, almost no legally binding decision in the EU system is taken without the involvement of the Council. And if it is taken without the signature of the Council on it, then it is the European Council that takes that decision. The place of the European Council in the EU system post-Lisbon and the crisis which further contributed to the importance of the European Council kept also the Council at the center stage of EU policy making. Now, in addition to these three institutional reasons, let me add that also the dynamics of domestic politics and their, I dare say, growing effects at EU level of policy making further complicate the matters, making it clear that while there is one Council, there are nevertheless the 27 member states. And this is what further contributes to the complexity of engaging with the Council, as I'm sure. Roland will explain uh, later on. What I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is give a hint as to the changes and trends in the structures, workflows and working methods in the Council. I do not aspire to cover the 40 plus pages on the Council and the European Council in the book. This is also not our intention, but I am looking forward to having a conversation about the latest developments. So let me start with the structures. This is where I would claim the Council is the simplest, the most straightforward of EU institutions. It is, in principle, the governments coming together at an appropriate level to eventually allow for decisions to be taken. At the top level, it's the representatives of the governments who can cast a vote on behalf of those governments. Simply put, it's the ministers. There's one Council of the ministers. They meet, however, in 10 configurations organize according to adjoining policy areas. There have been slight changes uh, in this respect 11 years ago but in, and a few years before, but in principle, the 10 configurations stay the same. Now, nine of those are cha chaired by the adequate minister of a country holding the rotating presidency, thus changing every six months. Now, contrasting the simple structure with the complexity of engagement, here's the first difficulty. The minister who prepares the meetings, leads the negotiations, gives a political push to the work of the council and engages with the other institutions on behalf of the council, changes every six months. This surely has effects on how you engage with the council. Now, with the minister changing, also those chairing other levels 
change, change as well. I should mention there are some exceptions, primarily those in the foreign affairs field, where the chairmanship is in the hands, not all, but in some cases in the hands of the high representative and the officials appointed by him. Now, returning to the structures, sec center stage is left for corporate. Now, starting with the corporate, this is the horizontal level just under the ministers. It brings together the ambassadors of the member states, which look after the coherence and legality of the work of the Council, and in essence, prepare the meetings and the decisions to be taken uh, by the ministers. The importance of this level can also be illustrated by the fact that in this year, despite the situations we're, I guess, still living in, they have never stopped meeting in person. Now, the division between Corporate 2 the ambassadors in charge of what is traditionally seen more political dossiers and corporate one, their deputies in charge of the internal market or more technical files might not be as hierarchical as it once was, but the atmosphere and the relations in the room still differ between the two corporates, just adding another nuance of complexity where you're engaging with uh, different, different policy areas. The corporate meetings are preceded by the meetings of the so-called, you see, Antici and Mertens attaches who prepare uh, the meetings usually a day before. The material for the, the documents for the corporate meetings, however, is prepared by attaches, councillors, experts working for the member states' governments based either in Brussels at the perm reps or in the capitals. And you see that there are working parties, about 150 of them, and about a dozen or so special committees meet regularly the usual rhythm being every two weeks, to work out the deals, to find compromise at their level, to clean the act, as they say. Now here as well, the chair rotates every six months. Uh, the committees, I should mention, do not represent yet another level. It's just uh, rather an indication of special importance to the scope of the, of the work of the committee. Now, this is a simple three-layer structure, which also indicates the workflow in the Council. Now, any item to be discussed enters the Council at the corporate level uh, and is sent then to the appropriate working party, usually an existing one. Occasionally, an ad hoc party needs to be set up. With the complexity of decision-making or the complexity of legal basis and policy-making in the last years, you do see some movements there and discussions being not that straightforward necessarily. It is at the level of the working parties that by some estimates 70 to 70 75% of all matters are cleared, meaning the compromise between all is achieved. The remaining issues prove to be either too political for the attaches uh, or too institutional maybe, and guidance is sought at the level of corper and given, this is indicated by the arrow on the slide going up and down, or corper solves those issues itself and then the items are left for the council to decide. Now ultimately there are issues that need to be tackled in a discussion by the council and then those are placed on the agenda of the meetings by the ministers for discussion. So you can have either the corper pushing back the working party to work out the deals subsequently, or you have corporate making the deals, or you have those deals ultimately made by the ministers. But I have to stress that um, the ministers do not just come in at the very last stage. It's not for them just to find compromise on the remaining issues. They come in earlier. They come in months before this letter uh, because the, you cannot count on ministers' engagement if you only involve them at the very last stage. So the ministers would be involved at earlier stages to have an orientation debate, to have a policy debate, um, to maybe analyze uh, a state of uh, discussions somewhere in between in order to keep them involved, in, in order for them to have ownership, in order to give them a chance to actually give the impetus for the lower levels to then work out the deals. Now, how do you plan for when you have to involve the ministers? Now, this is the presidency that decides how to treat the file, at which stage to involve the ministers, 
and in general, what dynamics to introduce to this ladder. Uh, these decisions are mostly taken ahead of the presidency, as each presidency submits the draft provisional council agendas for its entire term before it takes on the role. And how can these decisions be taken ahead of the presidency, you might wonder. How can now the next, the Portuguese presidency, be in the process of finalizing all the draft provisional agendas that they will have between January and July next year. Well, they work hard for it. They prepare well in advance. And this is also where the Commission comes into play. I did not mention the Commission so far. The Commission is not a member of the Council, but it has a standing invitation to any meeting at any level uh, in the Council. In most cases, the legislative proposals and other documents that the Council needs to agree on originate by the Commission. And as you can see on the slide here, showing the micro perspective of the work in the council working party, the commission is really the starting point. Not of everything, and of course in the foreign affairs field, the story is a bit different, but when we talk of legislative proposals, the vast majority of them originates from the commission and so do many other uh, documents. Now, why does commission come here into play when I'm talking about the planning in the council? Well, it's the commission that's aware of the difficulties that lie ahead. It spent about 18 months working on the formulation of its proposal, as was explained um, in this series of webinars a month ago in the webinar on the commission. And the commission is generally seen by the presidency as its principal partner in the council. Now, this doesn't mean that there are, there's agreement on the substance and not even on the process but working closely together with the Commission helps the Presidency understand the file and take decisions as to how it will run it. Now, the Commission is present at each meeting when the attaches put forward their positions and the Presidency seeks a compromise, a process you have on this slide. Now, in the Union of 27, deeply understanding the interests behind the positions and the ability to find a compromise between them the compromise that often needs to be agreed with the EP as well, is an enormous task. And this is where also the Council, despite being fairly stable, adapted its working methods. So in this chart or in this process in the working party, you will not see full table rounds. They are very uncommon. Uh, instead, numerous hours are spent on the phone mostly between the meetings, meetings to listen, test and advance on the file. Now, such momentum cannot be sustained forever. Presidencies remain in place for six months, just like little s has changed globally in terms of working methods in the council. In the very beginnings, the presidencies were there just for three months. There were proposals to move them to 12, but they stay in place for six months. Now, this is where I wanted to end, just as an introduction of the working methods. Um, with a global message on the previous slide on the importance of the Commission and on the fact that the Presidency runs the show, but that there are 27 member states and that it is the working party where the, so to speak, show starts. Now, a few things have changed, however, profoundly, and let me end, uh, finish on this. I would like to highlight three changes all related to adoption of decisions. You see here on the slide a chart from the VoteWatch EU. Now, first, consensus, a norm in the Council, long after the qualified majority became the actual rule, this was the normal rule since the Lisbon Treaty, seems to be giving away to the necessity of taking decisions faster. You can see statistics showing that, uh, you can see that um, you will find ever more files that had at least one member state voting against it, and you will find ever more member states actually voting against. Secondly, uh, it's not just one odd member state voting against the rest. Uh, what the numbers show is that ever more member states vote negatively, as I just said, and you can see on the attached chart the illustration of that. But you can also see that there is a variety of reasons why member states might 
cast a negative vote. You can just look at the geographical dispersion of those five countries on the chart. And you can also take UK a bit away out of that. Um, so not only that there is an odd member state voting against occasionally, but that there, we have a number of member states that are voting against for different reasons related to either their domestic politics or uh, their general position towards different files. Uh, let me add here that it also seems that this trend goes beyond in the single issues that allowing a member state to enter the chart of top five suggests that they vote negatively on a broader set of issues. And finally, the departure of the UK does and will have an effect on the coalition building in the council. Um, it's too soon to tell much. We do have some indications um, and there are some mathematical uh, think, um, uh, suggestions, um, but I would primarily say this also affects how to work with smaller member states or you know, with 23 plus member states in the union. But with this, I'm entering the domain of how to work with the council and uh, passing the floor on to Roland. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we were going to pause, I think, in case anyone had any clarifications at this point. But I think we'll just, there's no questions as of yet. So I think um, we'll continue to go through. Uh, thank you for that, Sabina. Um, yeah, I think we wanted to now focus on four areas. Why to work with the council, how to work with the council, uh, when and who to work with uh, in the council. Um, so, and indeed, my uh, part will be sort of describing a little bit how of the complexity of that and, and, and of the council and why, as, as John said, it has been and is considered quite opaque uh, to engage with. So there's a few sort of pointers here. Why work with the council? Well, of course, I think Sabina set out the case there quite clearly as that it's important. Uh, work doesn't get done. Leg uh, legislation doesn't get done without a council having a say. And it's the final say. It's the one that has the... Um, uh, final say, the, the final vote. And, con and conversely, there are also occasions when the council can uh, withdraw that support. Um, there are examples. So in, in my field, um, you know, my area is in environmental policy, so I won't uh, apologize for giving a couple of examples throughout on environmental policy, um, but the GM cultivation uh, uh, directive was, was held up for, for many years by the council because it couldn't get uh, a qualified majority and it just stuck it just stood there for ages and ages until it was eventually unblocked uh, under the Italian presidency in 2014. So and the soils directive is another one that in the end it just uh, was withdrawn because there was no way through. So the, the council has the final say. Um, the, the stakes are high so the council is the one in the end, the ministers will, will go home and be, be responsible themselves in their territory and their jurisdictions, the Im implementation of those rules. Um, and I think throughout this presentation, we're gonna focus mainly on the, these legislations, regu regulations, directive. I think it helps when you talk about the council. There are other aspects such as council conclusions, etc., cetera. Um, and we can cover those slightly too. And in that sense, you know, I'm covering in that purple book, chapter eight, there's also chapter nine talking about the ordinary legislative procedure, which is indeed what most proposals are going through. Um, the council is influential. So talking about some council conclusions, uh, actually it can give a steer to the commission. The commission uh, knows that it has to get its proposal through the council, through the parliament. And so it has, to, it will, it will, inevitably be influenced by that. It will want to get its proposals through. It won't want a, a case like the Soils Directive where it didn't happen. And it will want to therefore be guided by the council. And if it sees a majority for a proposal, then it's gonna be influenced by that in how it shapes its proposal. And while of course the commission will always be ambitious and always have the EU as its primary concern, Member states, it's much less so, even much less so for the parliament where you have political parties that are pan-European. So it's opaque, indeed it is opaque. Um, you know, the theater, the drama and the microphone are all in the room in the council. Um, and, and, and that's actually uh, what happens um, in the room. And actually, uh, and that in itself is quite closed. And so it's actually 
what happens outside the room that's as influential and as important. So imagine if those meetings um, that Sabina was talking about in the working methods in the working groups, there's no notes of those meetings, they're not held in public, um, they're not put on the websites, uh, there's no formal record that is publicized. You really um, don't know what's going on in that meeting. And then imagine if, if many of the discussions that also take place in the coffee, in the cafes, in the meeting rooms, in perm reps, in other formations, you, you, there's lots and lots of things that are going on that you're just not aware of. So uh, you need to go and talk to people, of course. And it's a policy jug, juggernaut, just like the European Parliament. Once that, I always, I always think it like, like a ball dropping uh, from the European Commission. Once that actually starts to drop in terms of the legislation, it's just a, really a question of time before it ends up in the official journal. So you, it will happen without you. And that's true of member states. You know, member states, <laughs> even though they're in the room, policies and proposals will get negotiated without them. You know, uh, and uh, that's why industry, that's why stakeholders, NGOs, they all need to be alert and alive to that. So uh, that's one on the why. The next slide on the how. So here are some tips, lots of things to say here, but really it's about focusing on, on these uh, um, five aspects about the national angle, being smart, you know, taking a dual approach, working, being efficient and getting your voice heard. Let me just call out a few things. Um, again, the council, as I mentioned, has um, a um, the constitution of 27 individual member states with individual concerns. So when you work with the council, you'll work with individual member states and you'll need to know where they're coming from. You'll need to know what political persuasion they are. You'll need to know if they're in a coalition with the Greens, with, with, the, with the socialists, what that coalition uh, comprises. You'll need to know um, if indeed, you know, there is a coalition, is the lead minister uh, that leads the department that you're interested in, what political persuasion are they? What are the national ambitions that they have? What will be the make and break of that government? Are they approaching elections? Will that make it difficult for them to make a decision? Surely it will. Um, and then, you know, what are their sacred cows? So we can talk about farming. Uh, we can talk about uh, literally cows, uh, automotive, uh, finance, shipping. Many member states have entrenched interests that you need to be aware of so that you can work with and through those. Um, and as I mentioned earlier about it being high stakes, it, uh, keep the end in sight. And that's what I was told as an attache, you really need to know what the implementation plan is when you're negotiating something in Brussels, uh, and not many do. And so if you can raise an issue that's going to be an issue for the implementation, better do it, better, better think about that. Be smart in your comms. So it's all very well and good going in and finding that national angle and saying, oh, this is, there's a factory in Flanders that's going to be, you know, impacted or a business here. But if you can't make a connection to the EU story, then it's going to be hard for the, your issue to catch fire. So what about if that factory is supplying vital resources across Europe? What if that is, is employing people across Europe? You start to um, develop a, a pan-European story, um, you know, and, and conversely, something like the growing of GM crops. Well, that's all very well. It's your in your field. But actually, you know, pollution crosses borders. So that if you can say, well, actually, it is your problem as well, it brings a European aspect to that argument. And that's really important um, because member states can't just be sitting there on the, on the, on the table banging the, the fist and, and demanding only action that is beneficial for them. It's not a good look. Um, Focusing on your communication, your desired outcomes is also, again, something that <laughs> many member states, departments are also not very good at. And it's about making sure that when you go and talk to people, you're focusing on the bigger picture. You're giving them freedom to then say, well, actually, um, there might be a different way of approaching this issue rather than just preventing that ban or getting an exemption from this. If you explain what you're trying to do as an, uh, as an industry or as a group of uh, uh, civil society uh, stakeholders, then you give the freedom to the uh, ne ne negotiators to, to understand how better to fit you in, uh, et cetera, and, and understand how better they work on that. And as Aaron, if you're listening to the engaging with the European Commission, you know, do bring good data because you know, there is an initial impact assessment done, um, but there's really, 
grey area around how the council itself does impact assessments. And it can, it has the power to, the presidency can invoke and task um, uh, member states to bring forward data. And it's in this moment that it's very, very useful. But of course, each individual department, each individual co uh, country will have their own t technical experts, policy experts, economists, statisticians, lawyers. So they won't be bereft of information, but it's, it's useful to help t to knit that together and bring that and bring that forward. Um, this could be very particularly useful for a smaller presidency when, when they're negotiating a file because they may not have the depth of resources as a bigger member state. Um, the dual approach, I think this is so fundamental. Um, we'll talk about it a bit more in the next slide, so I won't say too much, but it's Brussels and it's the capital, and it's about making sure that you are work with them in, in, in tandem. Um, and it's also being smart about being efficient, you know, working with other member states and other stakeholders to get your message out, to work uh, across the different uh, room, because it's all very well having a, a, an, an individual member state that gets your idea and champions it, uh, but if it doesn't have support of the others, uh, then, then um, you know, the room isn't really going to pick it up. And you really want a Mexican wave going on in that room. You want, you want people to say, yeah, that's a, that we, we, you know, plus one, plus one. Uh, and then the final point here is about, you know, getting your voice heard. You know, there are times when you may have to bring this issue back to the national level. The, the, you have uh, newspapers such as Le Monde, Financial Times, uh, Frank, uh, no, Frank, there's a FAZ, excuse my uh, lack of knowledge of German, but it's these newspapers are very well read, uh, uh, as well as BBC, of course, Politico, the European perspective. Uh, when I was in cabinet office uh, many years ago, uh, um, the prime minister's EU advisor at the time scanned all the newspapers to see what the uh, mood was and what the uh, things that were being picked up vis-a-vis -vis -vis European decisions. And my role was to work with the lead department, DEFRA, then to say, look, what's our position here? What's going on here? Why is this such a problem? Because, um, you know, whether it's light bulbs or vacuum cleaners or, or any other EU myth, or it's, it's sometimes if there is a real uh, argumentation to your point at a national level, it, it can help to raise the attention at that national level. Um, um, so be, be open to that and using multiple channels of communication because the, the desk officers and the, the attaches, they are um, also operating in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger picture. So that's on the why, that's on the how. This next slide is a bit, bit busy, um, it's a when. Um, and really, I just want to convey that you've got two levels um, and you've got the national, which is the top three, and then the, the, the uh, Brussels level, the, the, the uh, perm reps. So you've got the lead department and the lead minister, the top two, and then you've got the other, the other departments that will have an interest in that policy. Um, and then you've got the attaches and the ambassadors and their support team, the Mertens and the Antici, as Sabina was mentioning. And here I think you, you get to see that it's not, at the beginning, it's very much in the top left. It is for the individual department to develop the negotiating position and the negotiating strategy. Um, it's um, essential that you get, uh, that the ministers will have a, have a say on that. And the minister will want to know what is our position going into this directive uh, on the waste uh, directive? What's our position on the targets? What's our position on uh, all the aspects that relate to uh, the individual uh, requirements? And what's our strategy? How, who are we gonna work with? Who are our allies? Who's against us? Uh, who can who can help carry the message in Brussels? Do we need to do heavy lifting by our posts and capitals? What's the strategy? And if you can see, that's not the job of the perm rep, but the perm rep understands the, the negotiating uh, context in Brussels. The perm rep has its eyes and its ears on, on the ground, knows what will fly. You know, often people say that this isn't going to fly in Brussels. So it might be a beautiful negotiating position and it might be a wonderful negotiating strategy but it simply uh, won't have the legs. And so influencing uh, that uh, development of the negotiating position is fundamental for successful negotiation. You don't want your, as an attaché or as a perm rep um, or as a country overall, for your hands to be so tied, so boxed in, that you don't have any room to maneuver when it really matters. And so it was fundamental for me to make sure that I was clear what were my red lines and by the way, I don't mean 10, 
issues that I want to get, those could be desirable, I need to know what are my essential red lines that if, by the way, if we don't get this in the final document, we, the UK or whichever country now, will withdraw its support uh, in council. And that's a big deal and that's a, that matters and that's, a, that, that's ultimately what you have is your ultimate uh, withdrawal measure. Not that we have votes on every single matter, but the presidency will be calculating on every single issue. Hmm, I don't have a, a job, I don't have a qualified majority for this point. Better table it, and we'll come back to that later. So, really important that the perm rep is involved, but it will depend on various uh, countries as to how they do that. Uh, really important that the other government departments are involved, and that's why you could see it could be very salient to engage with these departments as the lead department uh, develops its position. In the negotiations in the working group, you see the perm rep has an essential role, the attaché. I speak about the environment working party because it's the working party I know the best, but it's very familiar in the transport party, the industrial issues, telecommunications, uh, social affairs, um, uh, energy, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, competition broadly. So those Corrupa 1 councils, um, particularly some Corrupa 2 councils, such as the ECOFIN, uh, Justice Home Affairs. So Corrupa 1, broadly, with the exception of agriculture, which is an exception, you know, these are uh, perm rep led negotiations. That's why the perm rep then comes in, very essential. So all of that time, we saw that working methods, figure 2.7, all of that time is with the perm rep and with the leader official in, in the government department. The minister is periodically kept involved, but of course they're very busy and they don't need to, they've set the negotiating position, they've agreed the strategy, it's your job now to go ahead and deliver that through the, the negotiations. In the, in the perm rep, my job as an earliest point of view, when I knew that that file was coming to Coripa, I would brief my ambassador. You brief the ambassador, the ambassador has a, a, a heads up because, and you particularly say, this is going to be difficult for this country because we're not going to potentially achieve our red lines or the, have, we have these problems. And then the ambassador suddenly says, right, can I help? What can I do? Can I talk to, to my contacts in my um, network, in my deputy permanent representatives or my permanent representatives? And they will have network and they have that helicopter view because they know in that day, They've got in the morning environment, in the afternoon, uh, uh, social affairs, and then it's transport, and then it's health. And they'll start to see trends and they'll go, hang on, in a minute ago, I was arguing against Spain on this issue. Now I'm with them. Could we not really see some al alignment here and, and see what's going on? This really helps. So essential that the ambassador's briefed well in advance, essential that the attaché does. And you can see that there's this handover that takes place you have the attaché and you have the ambassadors leading the negotiation when it gets to that stage. <laughs> One of my first stories when I first joined the perm rep back in May 2013, I had the lead official from the department and they were there in, in, in Brussels and they were briefing me and they said, can I come to the Corpa, please? And uh, I, naive, I said to my boss, can, can this happen? And they said, no, 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 absolutely not. It's for perm reps and, 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 and ambassadors, which is the perm rep. And that's when you know you arrive in that room, this huge, huge room, and you arrive in there, you're the only person, you're the only person as the attaché that can brief your ambassador, and the ambassador's the only person, with the exception of the Mertens and occasionally the, the, the attaché, uh, in case of substitutions, that can speak on behalf of your country. You can be on your Blackberry and texting the lead official and say, hey, look, this is what's happening, and often I was, but you're the only one there. The ambassador will say to you, I 100% rely on you, and of course, in turn, I would 100% rely on my uh, policy uh, officials. If your negotiation goes to council, and it's, it's rare these days, you might get a general approach or a first reading a position deal, uh, then, you know, all of the players come in. It's all open, it's all engaged, because actually, it's a quite a big deal, um, a general approach on a key file, as we just saw with the climate law, there'll be all hands, everyone will, will be there, the perm rep, the minister, the minister's office, the national policy lead, the attaché. So really, sort of, I wish I had thought about putting this slide into the book. <laughs> Sadly, it didn't go in, but it only occurred to me when we were uh, thinking about how to present all of this. And you can see there's critical roles for everyone. At certain points, some are more essential than others. And at certain points, some are, are important, but everyone has a role to play. The national lead 
has a clear role to play, but the, the pound rep at certain points is absolutely critical and essential. So you need to talk to these people, find out what's going on and know what's happening in the room. Because one thing is for sure, oh, I spoke to uh, Italy and they said they were going to support me. In the room, what happened? Nothing. So you need to verify, be clear. Are you actually going to be saying these in support of me, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many stories we could share on this. So last slide is um, we talked about the when and the who, because you've got the who there. Who else? We've mentioned the presidency. Um, as, as Sabina said, it's the political push. Um, and, you know, they run the show they, and they do. And the, the presidency is like a shot of adrenaline into the council. Because without that, as I said to you earlier, it could just go from one presidency or one moment to the next, not real energy to get the deal, to make it happen. Because at the end of the day, the council is the one that has to implement it. And, and you know, it's uh, it, the presidency, therefore, comes in as a shot of adrenaline and says, right, I really want to make this close this deal. I want to get a general approach or I want to close the deal in trialogues uh, or take it to trialogues or close the deal in trialogues or, or really have an ambition. And sometimes that ambition is too ambitious and they, and they fail. And so then, then they kind of concede, OK, we won't close the deal. We'll just have a progress report or we'll close a couple of chapters. Of course, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So if you don't close it, it doesn't matter. So there's an important to understand what the presidency wants to achieve. Uh, also, you know, I mentioned the trio. This is the uh, three presidencies, 18 months. It's great. One presidency will say, right, we'll start up the, uh, the working group on this particular file. You'll lead it and then you'll finish it. And then they'll aim to think in this uh, partnership way. Uh, the GSC, the General Secretariat, they're the masters of the process. They are the ones that outlast all the presidencies. The presidencies come, the presidencies go. The GSC is always there guiding the negotiation behind the scenes, masters of the process really good people if you can find someone in there to talk to they will give you factual information about when the policy uh, proposal was going into the council when's it going to Coropa? What, what stage is it at um we mentioned the commission uh, they had this standing invitation i like that phrase yes i'd love to sometimes we would the council would have loved to have withdrawn that invitation uh, on occasions but though in seriousness you need the commission the commission is defending its proposal quite right and it's there it's the commission show. At the beginning, it's the commission show. The commission defends it. The commission introduces it. The commission introduces its impact assessment. The commission introduces its way of going. And then it's really with the council to understand. But the commission is evergreen. It's ever present. It's always there. It's always guiding into the negotiations, coming up with, ah, huh, here's our plan B, as if they had it all along. Perhaps, perhaps not. But they're always there because ultimately it's there baby, it's the head of units and the, and the de department's baby, and they want to make sure that it's shepherded through, and, and, and that's natural, and therefore they play a key role in splitting the difference, in saying what will fly, what will not fly, but as, you know, as Sabina said, they don't have a vote, but of course, at the end of the negotiations, if they don't agree with a particular uh, uh, way of approaching it, they can withdraw their support, and then you need uh, you know, unanimity in the council to, to overrule that, so it's quite a big deal for the commission to use that nuclear option. So you just, everybody wants to be kept on board and that's the presidency's job. Last one, and then I will end and we can go into questions, uh, I, a word to the parliament. I mean, this is a, a, you know, you have to, when you're talking about a file going through, uh, the parliament, you know, the, I spent in a negotiation a lot of time talking to the parliament, you know, briefing the parliament. You have to be respectful of the presidency. The presidency leads the negotiations on behalf of the council. So a, a, a parent rep shouldn't undermine that, but you can reinforce that. And of course, if you know, you need to relay to the council or to the parliament, and particularly the uh, political group of the country where you're from that's in government or an influential member of your country, say, look, this is what's happening in council. I'm not really happy with how it's going. We're not really happy. We need to see what's, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you give them a, a, a flavour of the negotiating reality. Uh, and so it's important to understand that the, and the parliament can also um, then understand better how to pivot itself and negotiate and, and be, be, in a, be in a better place. Um, so it's very interesting and to keep you know all, all the commission the parliament you know and all of these uh, players in close hands 
Um, so yeah, we've talked about the why, the how, and the when, and, and the who else. I think that's a really uh, a good place to stop and to pause to see if there are any questions on, on engaging and working with the council. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Roland and Sabina, for that. Um, as I as, as um, mentioned in the chat, almost all of the charts and information in the presentation are available in the two books. So please do make sure if you haven't had a chance to buy them yet, pop onto the John Harper publishing website to get them. I'm certain um, Roland's uh, when to work with the council slide will potentially appear in a future edition. Um, but as, as also this um, presentation, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the website. Um, okay, so we'll come over to, to questions. Um, I will um, ask Sabina to answer a question first, give Roland a little bit of a break. Um, and it's a question from Pierre Gruning. Um, in um, recent years, the commission adjusted its internal decision-making system to make uh, better delivery on key policies, i.e. more hierarchy specific role of, of exec vice presidents, uh, priority given to green policies. Two short questions. Number one, how will the council coordinate the work on many Green Deal files? And number two, is there a need for Green Deal configuration to bring together environment, industry, economic views? Roland may want to come into this at the end. Um, so I'll let Sabina answer first, and then Roland may want to say a quick thing on this as well. Yes, indeed. I think it's a much better place question for Roland. But let me just say that um, about a year ago, the Council went through a soul-searching ser soul exercise to see if there is a need for the readjustment of different Council configurations in view of also the new priorities. The result was, let's say, a smaller scale of adjustment just like you would expect from an institution like that. There were discussions in particular with regard to how to account for the digital, how to reinvigorate the competitiveness, uh, and also very much on defense, but not on the environment. The second thing the council also did, it, they strengthened the terms of reference, if I can say so, for the uh, Friends of Presidency groups. So I would not expect anything from Green Deal going in there, meaning that there will be, uh, I believe, a more traditional ways of dealing with and then cooperation between uh, different uh, working groups and council formations, but I'll leave that uh, to Roland. And if I may, can I uh, also try to answer the question that was uh, uh, from Aaron about how do you make the Atasha speak? Now, I first sat in the council, I believe it was 2008. And what I noticed in the course of the years is maybe also because I'm getting older, but I had a, have a feeling that there is a seniority, growing seniority in the representation in the council. Uh, being a working party attaché is no longer the first post you get. Uh, now, having said that, actually slightly contradicts to what Aaron might have asked, um, but I think what we're having here is also the fact that many things happen in the back, and then maybe we also have some issues with complexity of policies. And there have been many uh, attaches, and I'm sure Roland knows more of those, who kind of search for input because it is at the level of complexities, it is really difficult to engage, which is why you need experts from home coming in. And I guess uh, this has been, this has really suffered in the last decade or so, it's been a decade, with the financial economic crisis. You could clearly see that the member states, while increasing the seniority, have reduced the coupling of an attaché with an expert uh, in the room. That would be, let's say, my attempt to answer uh, that question and then passing on to Roland for his insights into how the Council will um, manage the Green Deal package. Yeah, I mean, I've, there's been situations where there's, on, the, on the point about experts, experts can be absolutely, you need them in the room in order to know how to um, speak up as an attaché. Um, at the same time, there's been situations where the, you can have two experts from the same country come to the same meeting and fight to get on the microphone. So they're, you know, they're like arguing with the attaché and saying, no, we should be saying, you've got to speak with one voice. I think this comes back to the point about being mute. It comes back to the, ne the negotiating position it comes back to the negotiating strategy. It comes back to the size of the member state. 
So I used to sit next to Estonia and Estonia would always nudge me and say, hey, you're the UK. Why don't you say this point? Why don't you say this point? And then I'll just support you. And, and so you, you, you do find that smaller member states will keep their powder dry, for the key issues that they need. But also I said to you, you know, the theatre, the drama, the microphone is all in the room. But it's what happens outside the room. And I think that most of these countries as well are effective in, in those bilaterals they're having with the presidency of other member states. Um, and even the UK, the UK would have, as I said to you, a list of 10 issues, of which three are priority. Well, I would lobby issue four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten to my counterparts and say, look, we are seem to be aligned on these issues. Why don't you raise that? I will support you. Job done. Let's go on. And so this is the, you know, an, an attache has to be a hustler if they're going to do a good job, a good hustler, working the angles, talking to people, understanding what's possible. And so I think that, you know, having a clear negotiating position, having a clear understanding of the brief. And I think that, you know, sometimes attaches are overwhelmed um, and that's why they need the, the officials there. But you do need a good negotiating position and you do need to have that as, a, as an outset. On the European Green Deal, oh, I just think the council so prosaic. You know, I just think that you have a transport policy, you will go through the transport council. You have a climate policy, you will go through the environment council. You have a, you know, uh, uh, a policy on pesticides that will go through, you know, the agricultural uh, attaché. You know, it will go through the um, stand committee. It's it's so prosaic. You know, at the end. You know, look at the digital digital conclude, council conclusions on digital policy. Uh, at the moment, they're just going through the environment council, uh, and they will only have the uh, environment attaché in Germany report to the industry or the digital attaché. Uh, in other instances, you have the greening of the European semester, which is the current theme. And in, in October, there were many different council configurations that would give their opinion. So the ECOFIN, the industry, uh, COMPET, transport perhaps, not so much, uh, the environment certainly. And they would all sort of, you know, try to, if that's what the presidency wants to do, by the way. Uh, and so again, the presidency can have a role in this way. The presidency can do ad hoc. The presidency can create uh, joint groups for a file. So the industry and environment groups were the joint groups leading on the REACH uh, proposal back in 2005. So there is precedent. And that's when you need your uh, general secretary of the council to help you work out what, what is possible. On the council conclusions for Africa, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to know. I mean, again, I think it's the presidency, uh, unless this is an EEAS matter. I don't know. I can't quite figure. So you need to know who the chair of the, if it's the EAS or the presidency. They are the first ones that need to know if that's going to be a, an issue to fly uh, and they want to push and, and to pursue um, and then I think you're looking at, at finding the path of least um, um, opposition. And so, you're, so you want to at least neutralize and make sure that, well, if no, there's not going to be anyone in the room that's going to oppose the idea. Um, and, and as to, to, to Aaron's point, a lot of people don't say anything in the room because they have nothing to say. And so they're not going to oppose it. So that's great. Fantastic. It will go through, perhaps. Uh, of course, if those are your most vocal opponents, well, why, are they, why are they against it? Or oh, because of precedent setting, or why are they against it? Or oh, because of it's not right for the, the, the not the right timing, or whatever. Or we've already done this last year. So understanding those um, oppositions is quite important. And uh, yeah, you may not need 27 member states to, to get your issue through. You may just need to you know work with those that are against, and, and, and actually uh, then also work with you know the multiplier effect. If you have those four, they should do your work as well. They should also talk to the other people that are in the room. On the transparency register, uh, yes, I'll come, I'll, I might come back. Well, I think that, you know, lobbying in Brussels is always different to lobbying in capitals. And I think in capitals, there is a bit of a, even in the UK situation, it was always very difficult to know, should I be engaging with this um, stakeholder? Or, and actually in Brussels, it's very open. And, you know, it's as long as you are being clear who you're um, and, um, you know, lobbying on behalf of and you're on the transparency register, Attaches would always use those stakeholder meetings. They weren't obliged to take them, but they would always use them as a two-way street. So find out what's, what they're hearing and then transmit information to them about the, 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 the government's position, see what works, see what flies, keep in touch, keep in touch throughout the, the negotiation. And the earlier you do that in the, in the negotiation, the more uh, likely it is that you're going to be able to uh, continue to nurture that relationship. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm getting... <laughs> 
Roland, you're getting very popular at the moment with lots of, lots of questions coming in now. Um, so the last question from Agnieszka is how can an NGO try and engage with the council and achieve their goal uh, without well, being in the negotiation room? Well, I think, you know, NGOs are um, civil society groups. They are representative of society. So society, any, any constituent needs to first have a locus in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nation, in a, in, a, in a member state. Um, Pan-European issues clearly are more challenging. Um, you will always find some member states are more open to the um, issues that are set out by that NGO, and that's the first place to go to. Who's going to be your likely allies? Uh, the Commission will also have that societal public good endeavour. So if the Commission is your ally, then the Commission's proposal ought to initially reflect that. Um, and of course, you know, um, you can, as an NGO, um, have all sorts of, you know, at the beginning, so in, before every Environment Council, there would be the um, NGO uh, E10, I can't think what it's called, E10, something like this, and they would have this shadow meeting before the Environment Council, invite an Environment Minister to speak at that event, and it would um, help to uh, facilitate, you know, good working relationships, um, getting their views across. So. You know, NGOs can be creative, can be obviously looking for those that are most most likely to, to to support their cause. And, you know, as any stakeholder, bring evidence, bring facts uh, that will help to, you know, bring forward the case. Thank you very much for that, Roland, um, for that answer. Um, we've now come to, to one o'clock. I think we've managed to get through all of the questions. Um, on behalf of John Harper Publishing, I want to thank firstly Sabina Lange and Roland Moore for their really fascinating um, presentations and insights into the yellow and orange books. Um, as I've mentioned 20 odd times already, but I've mentioned it once again, do go out, do buy your book. It is very much worth it. We can see our lovely authors showing off their books as well. Um, you can get them on the um, uh, John Harper Publishing website, and you can also buy them in certain uh, stores around Brussels, which will be available, which is available on the John Harper Publishing uh, website, where you can get those. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you, of course, for attending um, this seminar. It's it's been really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to thank John Harper Publishing for putting on the the webinar um, Insider Series. Um, we will be having future ones coming up very soon, so make sure you check the John Harper Publishing website, you can see it on the screen. Um, the video of this webinar will be available afterwards via the John Harper Publishing website, so I encourage those of you attending, um, your colleagues who haven't been able to make the call, firstly it's sad they couldn't make the call, but do send them in the direction of the video, it's definitely worth them having a watch and listening in. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. So on behalf of John Harper Publishing, massive thank you to everyone involved. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you so much.